And thanks to everyone for joining the NCCN patient webinar, Know What Your Doctors Know, CAR T-cell therapy for lymphoma and side effects. My name is Erin Vidic. I'm a member of the patient information team at NCCN, and I will be moderating today's webinar. The National Comprehensive Cancer Network is a not-for-profit alliance of 33 leading cancer centers across the United States devoted to patient care, research, and education. The NCCN Foundation is a nonprofit organization that raises funds for NCCN patient resources. These are funded using financial support from generous donors. The NCCN guidelines for patients are based on the NCCN clinical practice guidelines and oncology used by healthcare providers worldwide. They explain the same cancer care options, but are written for those with cancer, their caregivers, family, and friends. You can view and download the NCCN guidelines for patients free from the NCCN website. High quality printed copies of the guides are available on Amazon. NCCN patient webinars complement the NCCN guidelines for patients. They cover a series of topics discussed by expert presenters. Viewers will have an opportunity to ask questions at the end of the presentation. This brings me to the presenters for today's webinar. I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Philippe Armand. Dr. Armand is a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, as well as the chief of the Division of Lymphoma at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Next, we will hear from Lauren Desnoyers. Lauren is an oncology nurse navigator in the Immune Effector Cell Program, also at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Our third presenter today is Amanda O'Neill. Amanda is a patient advocate and information specialist with the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. Now I will turn it over to Dr. Armand. Thank you very much. Thank you, Erin. So I'm just a warm up act for Lauren and Amanda, uh, and I'm gonna talk for next 20 minutes or so about some background of CAR-T and lymphoma, mostly focusing, but not only on the toxicity of CAR-T. Uh, and the first thing I wanna start with this picture I would ask if I were in a live audience uh, who can tell me what this is, but in fact, it's not a hat. Uh, it's from uh, this wonderful book called Le Petit Prince, and it says it's not a picture of a hat, it's a picture of a boa constrictor digesting an elephant. So I had to try my own hand at this. So I would say, well, what's this then? And, uh, and this, is the, this is the coin of CAR T cell for me, uh, where one half of the coin, which is much larger than the other, is the efficacy, but there's still a side of the coin that's toxicity that's quite important uh, and important for, for us to learn how to deal with and manage and important for patients to understand or for caregivers to understand. So we can't really talk about toxicity without talking about efficacy because I think that is the, still the largest side of the coin. So let's spend a few slides on whether the toxicity that we're gonna talk about in a little bit is actually worth it. Uh, and, and here's a brief introduction, just so we're on the same page. Lauren is going to talk more about this, but about the process of CAR-T, which starts with the removal of blood from patients uh, through uh, uh, IVs to collect the T-cells, and then the T-cells get sent to a lab where they're made into the CAR-T-cells that have the new receptor that you can see here in, in blue and red, and that receptor can then target the tumor cells. In the case of what we're going to talk about, it's mostly CD19 is a receptor to target uh, B-cell lymphoma. And then the patient undergoes lymphodepletion chemotherapy, which again, Lauren will talk about a little bit more. Uh, and then the CAR T cells are reinfused in the patient, sometimes inpatient, sometimes outpatient. And then they go in and they're supposed to find the cancer and kill the cancer cells, and we hope cure the patient. So, so a couple of, of fundamental questions, which I think are, are, are critical to understanding CAR T. And the first is, why do we need CAR T? Why don't normal T cells do the job? Uh, and this has to do with the fact that the body and the immune system is very good about not targeting self. So we spend actually a lot of effort when we're very tiny to educate our immune system to not attack our own cells. And so when our immune system sees cancer cells, Part of the reason they don't attack the cancer cell is because they think of it as self. So there's no effective response against it. And the second question is, why do we use these autologous cells? Well, why do we need the patient cell as opposed to using somebody else's CAR T cells? Uh, and in fact, there's a lot of research that is going into this, into designing these so-called allo CAR T cells. But, but the reason is that our immune system is also constantly in surveillance mode for anything that's foreign 
for the same reason. We protect self, but we attack what's foreign. So when you come in with somebody else's CAR T cell, the body would recognize those CAR T as being foreign and attack it. So the CAR T cells from somebody else would not survive well in a patient. Again, there are ways to get at that, which is what this allogeneic CAR T is about, but the CAR T that we're going to talk here and the ones that are commercially available are all autologous CAR T cells. Um, the, the CAR T lymphoma, there, there are several trials which are listed here and which have formed the basis for the FDA approvals in diffuse large B cell lymphoma and related disease, mental cell lymphoma, and follicular lymphoma. And I've only, gonna, I've only put up one graph, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but this is a graph from the study that's called TRANSFORM, and TRANSFORM was a study in second-line diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So patients had one prior line of therapy and either relapsed or were not going to remission from that therapy, and they were randomized to what used to be the standard of care, which is called SOC here, which was typically chemotherapy and, an, and a stem cell transplant, or CAR T cell. In this case, the product is lysocell. And you can see the red line is the patients that got lysocell, and it's the proportion of patients who survived without an event, so without relapse, without having a fatal complication, without needing additional lymphoma treatment. And you can see how much higher it is than the blue line, which is the patients that got standard of care. That's a huge difference in efficacy, and it's, it's really immediately changed what we do for patients, where the patients who are who would have fit the clinical trial and who fit the label, we now use CAR T in second line uh, because it's such a big difference uh, in, in efficacy over what used to be standard of care. So hopefully that communicates to you without too much data, uh, some of the reason why this therapy is so exciting uh, for us today. And so now there are a bunch of FDA approvals. Uh, there are three in large cell lymphoma, one, one in mantle cell lymphoma, two in follicular lymphoma. So having said that, Say, well, okay, so maybe it is all worth it because the efficacy of this therapy is, is really revolutionary. But still, what's the downside? Which, and there is one, uh, and that's the toxicity of the treatment. So there are four pieces to the toxicity. Uh, the toxicity from the chemotherapy, from the lymphodepletion chemotherapy, this phenomenon called cytokine release syndrome, which we'll talk more about, this neurological phenomenon called immune effector cell-associated neurotoxicity, or ICANS for short, and then bone marrow suppression, referring to prolonged low blood cell count. I'm not going to talk about the chemotherapy toxicity because that's uh, not, not specific to CAR-T. Uh, I spend most of the time on, on two and three. So let's start with cytokine release syndrome, or CRS. What it is is really an, an activation of inflammatory cascades. So there's an activation of the T cells. They release a lot of inflammatory molecules. They drive other cells, other immune cells in the body to release more molecules. So all these molecules that you probably have heard of, interleukin-1, interleukin-6, TNF-alpha, interferon-gamma, these other ones that you can see on the slide, are all released when the CAR-T gets introduced in the body and finds its target. And it's made, as I said, not just by the CAR-T, but also by non-CAR-T cells and by these other cells, which are called monocytes or macrophages. And that causes a lot of mayhem. Uh, but before we talk about the manifestations, we talk about the risk factors. So who's more likely to get CRS or more likely to get se severe CRS? Mostly it's related to two things. The major one is tumor burden. So patients come in, if they have more lymphoma, if they have a larger burden of lymphoma, they're more likely to get CRS. And the other one is the baseline level of inflammation. That's measured by things like C-reactive protein or ferritin, although those are very crude tools to measure inflammation. But we know that the more inflammation there is at baseline, it makes sense, the higher the risk of CRS is gonna be. It's almost if you already are halfway towards an inflammatory state, that you need less activation from the CAR-T uh, to, to tip people over into, um, into overt CRS or severe CRS. And then in the last line, you can see that the peak expansion of CAR-T so the more the CAR-T expand, the more they're likely to drive CRS, but that's not really something that we often measure uh, practically in, in patients. So how does CRS present? The most common symptom is fever. And now with the, the, the current uh, definitions that we have, you basically have to have a fever to, have, uh, to be considered CRS. So the mildest form of CRS is just a fever. As it gets more severe, we start to see hypotension, which is low blood pressure. And that can go all the way from irrelevant to the patients. It could be 
that their, their blood pressure cup reads a little lower, maybe they get a little bit of fluid, all the way to shock, which is a very severe form of low blood pressure. Uh, the other manifestation is hypoxia, which means low oxygen in the blood. And again, that can be a minor event that did they just require nasal cannula and supplemental oxygen, all the way to requiring intubation and mechanical ventilation, also a big deal. And then uh, also less commonly, other organ dysfunction, for example, the kidneys, the liver, again, ranging from just abnormal labs that don't bother anybody, all the way to organ failure, for example, requiring dialysis. So you can see CRS really spans a gamut from something that's almost trivial, like a fever, to something that's life-threatening. So now we have these systems for grading CRS, uh, and you can see the, the grading system below. We obviously don't need to go through it, other than to mention that at one end, on the, on the left side, if you look at grade one CRS, just means having a fever. When you look at severe CRS, which is grade three, grade four, you can see you're requiring vasopressor, meaning uh, blood pressure, uh, medications to support the blood pressure, more oxygen, mechanical ventilation. So this is when people are, are much sicker, usually require ICU level care, et cetera. And the incidence of CRS depends on the product, like many things with CAR T-cell. So the, the three products that are approved in lymphoma are AxiCell, T-cell, and Lysacell. The full names are much longer and more complicated, but you need a separate degree just to be able to pronounce those names. Uh, and AxiCell is, I think, unquestionably the most toxic of the products. So the rate of CRS is about 90%. The rate of severe CRS is 5 to 10%. Compare that to T-cell, which is 60%, about 60% overall, 5% severe, and Lysacell, which is about 50% overall, 1% severe. CRS has decreased with uh, increased expertise, so we've gotten better at managing it and especially by intervening early. So even with AxiCell, as we've learned to intervene earlier on clinical trials, you can see the rate of severe CRS has gone down a lot. And the treatment of CRS is supportive care. So of course, treating blood pressure, treating organ dysfunction, providing oxygen, et cetera. Intervening early, like I said, has become a, a big part of how we manage it. We use a lot of drug called tocilizumab, which is an antibody that blocks interleukin-6 receptor, one of the mediators of inflammation. We use a lot of corticosteroids. And then in more advanced cases, we use some of these other drugs that are listed here, but much, much more rarely. Okay, let's move to the, the next major and, and rather unique toxicity of CAR-T, which is ICANS. Uh, and ICANS also uh, is an inflammatory toxicity, uh, also potentially related to the um, activation of uh, cells in the blood vessel walls and to disruption of those cells and alteration in the coagulation cascade, maybe also because some of that CD19 target exists on some of the brain cells. That's probably a minor mechanism. But these things, this inflammation or this blood vessel toxicity is happening a lot in the brain. So the manifestations are neurologic. The risk factors are similar to CRS. That's inflammation is a big risk factor. And in fact, CRS itself is a risk factor. So patients who have more severe CRS are more likely to also get more neurotoxicity. And the manifestations can be quite variable. Often patients have word-finding difficulty. They can have tremors, so a little bit of shaking. They can have weakness, confusion, somnolence. They get sleepy, all the way to the most severe presentation, which are seizures or coma or cerebral edema with swelling of the brain, which is obviously a, a much more serious and life-threatening complication. There's a similar grading system. It's a little more complicated to read, but I would just say the grade three and four, again, is where this, is, this gets to be severe, and grade four is, is typically where we really think of it as becoming a, a life-threatening problem. The incidence here, again, depends on the product. Uh, AxiCell still takes the lead with about, about two-thirds of the patient having some neurotoxicity and severe maybe 20%. T-cell, 40 and 5. Lysacell, which has a, the the most favorable safety profile, uh, at, with about 10% only of patients getting neurotoxicity, only about 5% severe. Like CRS, this has decreased with increased expertise, and like CRS, this has decreased with early intervention. So you can see again with AxiCell, the rate of severe neurotoxicity has gone down from about 30% at first to now about 15% with more aggressive and early intervention. So what's this intervention? Still supportive care very much, anti-seizure medications, et cetera. Corticosteroids, in this case, is the mainstay. Tocilizumab should not be used just for neurotoxicity. 
but corticosteroids is the, the, the main agent that we use. We use anti-seizure medications either for prevention or for treatment of seizures. And then again, much less likely, but drugs like anakinra, siltuximab, or management of the intracranial pressure if there is swelling. And then lastly, let's talk a little bit about bone marrow suppression. This is something that we're becoming increasingly aware of. Uh, we don't really understand why it works, although so there's a lot of interesting research that's coming out of uh, various labs in the country uh, to suggest potential mechanisms, especially T-cell-derived mechanisms for this. If you look across the studies, about a third of the patients still have low blood counts at 30 days, so one month out from their CAR-T. And when you look one year out, it may be a sixth of patient. We don't know how to best manage this complication. We give transfusion or growth factors, but we haven't really come across, come, come up with standard management algorithms or management strategies, because as I said, we don't exactly understand yet what the biological mechanism for this is. So I think there's gonna be a lot more coming on this, both uh, in, in identifying what drives this and in figuring out how best to deal with it. Lastly, we can, of course, talk about the most, the most scary toxicity, which is death. Uh, and, and so we can put this under this rubric of non-relapse mortality. So non-relapse mortality basically means the mortality from something other than the lymphoma coming back. And that could be anything. So anything that's not lymphoma counts as non-relapse mortality. Uh, and fortunately, with CAR-T, this is very rare. And even more fortunately, it's getting rarer. It depends a little bit on how you define it. When you're looking at the direct treatment-related mortality, so for example, you look in the first month and you say how many patients die and we think they died from CAR-T toxicity, it's probably around 1% or 2%. So it's not zero, but it's pretty small. If you look at one or two within the first one or two years and you take a broader view and you say how many patients died and it wasn't because the lymphoma came back, it's about 10%. So it's actually not insignificant. And these are things like infection in particular that patients may fall prey to later on in their course. So in conclusion, I think for, for all of us who treat lymphoma, the efficacy of CAR-T therapy has really been transformative. Uh, and undeniably, it forms a much larger size of the coin than the toxicity. But toxicity is still a very important aspect of CAR-T management. Uh, and it's important, as I said earlier, both for physicians and, and uh, uh, other healthcare providers to be able to manage the toxicity of CAR-T and for patients to be aware of what it is that they're getting into uh, when they sign up for CAR-T. It's, it's really a big part of the patient experience and, and Lauren and, and Allison will speak more to that. It's mostly an acute event, so most of it happens in the early period, in the first couple of weeks after CAR-T. Uh, it is an evolution, so as we learn to do this better, we learn the mechanisms, we learn what drugs to use, we're definitely better at it, and the toxicities are definitely less now. It still remains severe in about 10% of patients, but it's very, very rarely fatal, especially if you think about just that acute toxicity. And there's a lot of ongoing work that many people are doing across the country and the world that's directed at the reduction, at the mitigation of those toxicities. So with that, I will thank you and cede the floor to Lauren. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Armand. Um, so my name is Lauren. I'm a nurse at Dana-Farber, and I'll be talking a little bit more about what this experience looks like for the patient and their caregivers. So for each patient, there's a multidisciplinary team of people who are handling not only the clinical parts of their treatment, but also addressing things like their social, psychosocial needs and the financial aspects of their treatment. You'll see in this table here, there's a list of all the different roles of people who are involved in CAR-T therapy. Um, as the nurse navigator, my role begins when a patient is referred for CAR-T therapy from their doctor. I begin by screening the patients and arranging for whatever necessary clinical workup there is to ensure that they not only meet the criteria for this treatment, but also to make sure that this is an appropriate treatment for them and something that they're, they're safe um, and that they'll tolerate. Um, so this could involve getting um, PET scans and other imaging to kind of help us determine their burden of disease, also echocardiograms, EKGs, blood work um, to ensure their, their hearts, kidneys, everything else is functioning appropriately and they're otherwise healthy and safe to undergo CAR-T therapy. I also act as the clinical contact for these patients, so I'm available to answer any questions that they might have about the treatment, the side effects, and any other questions or concerns that they might have, and provide guidance or connect them to the right people. 
Um, I'm also a liaison between our treatment center and outside treatment centers. We do get a lot of patients referred to us from outside uh, clinics. So I am in touch with their local providers to make sure that we have everything that we need to get them through CAR-T. And I also speak very frequently with the manufacturers of the CAR-T products, um, coordinating the collection, the manufacturing, and then the delivery of the final CAR-T product. So once the screening process is complete and the patients are ready to proceed with CAR-T therapy, there's four major steps involved. Step one is leukapheresis. Then we have manufacturing and bridging therapy. Step three is lymphodepletion chemotherapy. And then finally, step four is the infusion of the CAR-T cells. With step one, that's leukapheresis. So this is the process of collecting the white blood cells from a patient's blood. You'll see in this image here, this woman is collected, uh, collecting her T-cells on an apheresis machine. So blood is removed from one set of IV tubing. And this blood passes through a machine that's able to separate the white blood cells with those T-cells from the blood. Um, so it's basically a centrifuge machine that's going to be able to isolate those white blood cells into a separate bag and allow the rest of the blood to return back to the patient through a second set of IV tubing. Um, so this means that the patient gets all of their red blood cells, their platelets, their plasma, everything else is returned back to them and just that small sample of, of white blood cells is collected in a bag. We have the option to collect these T cells peripherally from veins and a patient's arms or from a temporary central line that would be placed in their chest. Uh, a vein assessment is part of our standard screening uh, workup. So a pharesis nurse will assess a patient's veins to determine the quality and the reliability of their veins and ensure that they'd be able to tolerate the apheresis procedure itself. And if there was any question about the, the vein access, then we would place a temporary central line. So this is something that's in place just for this collection and then it's, it's able to be removed. Um, this is a painless procedure. You basically just sit back and let the machine do all the work. And it's a single day procedure. It takes about four hours from start to finish. So once those cells are collected, they're able to be sent off to a lab, which is going to genetically engineer them to become CAR T cells. So this process involves having the T cells modified with a special gene that's going to give them the ability to have a special receptor that is able to recognize the proteins or antigens that live on the lymphoma cells and distinguish them as lymphoma cells. And this special receptor is called a chimeric antigen receptor or CAR. And that's what's going to help make these T cells specialized and able to find the lymphoma, bind to them, and then destroy them. And this manufacturing process typically takes about three to four weeks. During that time, they're not only engineering these cells, but they're growing millions and millions of CAR T cells. And because it's going to take several weeks for this to happen, we often give patients something called bridging therapy to help keep their lymphoma at bay during this time. Um, and that can vary based on the patient, the symptoms that they have, their burden of disease. So some people might get radiation, they might get chemotherapy, or maybe even just a course of steroids. And a lot of patients, like I said, are coming to us from outside clinics. So as the nurse, I'm often coordinating with their local oncologist to coordinate their treatment locally so that it reduces their back and forth travel. So once those cells are finished their manufacturing, we begin the lymphodepletion chemotherapy. We use two particular types of chemotherapy. The first is called cyclophosphamide or cytoxin. The second drug is called fludarabine or fludera. And these are two chemotherapies given in the clinic over three days. And this helps to prepare the patient's body for the CAR T cell infusion. The intent here is not really focused on treating the lymphoma, but more to make room within the patient's immune system for these CAR T cells to be infused and expand, multiply, and ultimately do their job of killing the lymphoma. So oftentimes it's dosed less than what patients have previously had in a typical lymphoma regimen, so the chemo is usually pretty well tolerated. Um, but as a nurse, I do a lot of education on how patients should be managing their symptoms, whether it's nausea, vomiting, low blood counts, fatigue, hair loss, really encouraging hydration, but also ref uh, reviewing the symptoms that we would want them to notify their physicians about, whether that's fevers, bleeding, lightheadedness, dizziness, things that are a little bit more concerning with chemotherapy. You'll see here is a little clip of a calendar that I would be 
providing a patient, we begin the chemotherapy five days out from their infusion date. So that would be day minus five. And then minus five, four, three are the chemo days, followed by a full rest day and then possibly an admission to the hospital before getting their CAR T cells. So the final step is step four, which is the infusion of the CAR T cells. And we refer to this as a patient's day zero. CAR T cells are always infused via a central line. Many times our patients are coming to us with ports already in place, so we're able to use those, but other times we'll place either a Hickman line or a PIC line, just something that will give us really reliable central, central line access to the patient. All CAR T cells are administered by a specially trained nurse. So she's familiar with administration as well as the monitoring both during and after the CAR T cell infusion. The infusion itself is quite brief. It's usually less than 30 minutes and it's very similar to getting a blood transfusion or a platelet transfusion. And it can take place either inpatient or outpatient in the clinic setting. And on the next slide, I'll kind of talk about what the difference is. So for our patients who are admitted to the hospital, the infusion happens at the bedside in their hospital room, again, with specially trained staff infusing the cells. And then every day they are rounded on by a staff of nurses, doctors, physician assistants, and they do an, a full head to toe assessment as well as a pretty thorough neurological assessment to help us figure out how they're tolerating the treatment. Um, the minimum day, uh, minimum amount of time for the hospital admission is eight days, which means that the patient could be discharged from the hospital as soon as one week after their infusion. Following their discharge from the hospital, patients must remain within two hours of the treatment center, and that's to ensure that they are able to get back to us if there are any concerns about um, re recurrent or delayed toxicities. They also need to have a constant companion starting from their discharge from the hospital until their day 30 or one month out from their infusion. And then the, they're also restricted from driving or operating heavy machinery until day 60 or two months from the infusion. So for our patients who are infused in the outpatient setting, they get their cells infused in the clinic, again, with a specially trained nurse. And rather than being inpatient and getting a daily assessment while they're in the hospital bed, they come into clinic each day. They have a thorough head to toe assessment, a neurological assessment, vital signs and blood work, and then they're able to either return home or to their hotel. Again, these patients, we want them to remain close to us so that if any concerns or toxicities came up, they could easily get back to their treatment center. With the outpatient setting, because the first week is a more, or the first two weeks is a more acute time, they have to remain a little bit closer. So we ask that they remain within 30 minutes for those first two weeks. And then after those first two weeks, they're able to travel outside of the, the 30 minutes and just be within two hours of our treatment site. Again, they need to have a constant companion. However, with the outpatient setting, we require that the constant companion is with them from, starting from day zero until their one month mark. And this is a more involved role. And again, they are unable to drive or operate any heavy machinery until day 60. I'll talk a little bit more about that caregiver role. Um, the caregivers must stay with the patient for 24 hours a day, seven days a week, for the first 30 days following their CAR T therapy. So again, if it's an inpatient CAR T infusion, it's this caregiver role begins upon the patient's discharge from the hospital. If it's an ambulatory setting, then the caregiver starts right at day zero. And this caregiver is responsible for monitoring the patient for side effects and then relaying that information back to the CAR T team. We do a lot of really frequent one on one training with the caregivers to make sure that they're comfortable with this responsibility. They know what they need to be looking out for. And those would be those cytokine release syndrome symptoms, the neurotoxicity, and then anything else that just doesn't seem right. Um, you'll see here, this is a table, an example of what our outpatient CAR T caregivers are looking at. So they're responsible for checking vital signs multiple times a day and then doing that, doing that thorough neurological assessment. So if you look at this chart, they're asking the patient several questions a couple times a day and will ultimately give the patient a score. You'll see the ICE score at the bottom. That means immune effector cell encephalopathy score. 
So an ideal score is a score of 10 with these points given for every correct answer. Anything less than 10 would indicate some degree of possible neurological toxicity. And like Dr. Armand went over, we have algorithms for determining how they need to be treated. So some of the key education points that we go over um, would be, again, talking about those side effects of the treatment, the cytokine release syndrome, that's that hyperactive immune response to these CAR T cells circulating and attacking the lymphoma and presenting like the flu-like symptoms with fevers, um, fatigue, possible low blood pressures, oxygen requirements. And then we have the neurological toxicity, those complications re resulting from the inflammation and can vary in their severity and how they present. Um, usually both of these side effects are pretty distressing to patients ahead of time and, and then during. So a lot of emotional support and education about how these things are managed, what should be looking out for um, is, is frequently reviewed with the patients and their families. Um, every program has their own requirements, but a lot of the requirements are, are pretty consistent of, of among all treatment centers. Um, and those would be the 30 day constant caregiver and then remaining within two hours of the treatment center. The other is the 60 days of no driving or operating any heavy machinery. And the rationale there is that we wouldn't want anybody to ha have any sort of neurological side effects show up a little bit late and put them in an unsafe position, both at a risk uh, to themselves and then to other people. Other education points that we review, um, a lot of patients have questions about nutrition after CAR T therapy. Um, people who are familiar with undergoing stem cell transplant ask if they need to be on a special diet. And with CAR T therapy, we don't have any sort of dietary restrictions or changes, but we do encourage that patients continue to eat healthy foods, make sure that their produce is clean, their, their meat's fully cooked. Um, we, we talk to patients about how their appetite is and if they're experiencing any nausea, vomiting, poor appetite, we can make recommendations or connect them to nutrition specialists to manage their diets. Um, physical, ther physical activity is another question that we get asked a lot. I would say in my experience, fatigue is the number one complaint that we see in patients after they're discharged from CAR-T therapy. And it can take several months for patients to kind of really start to feel back to normal, um, both from the chemotherapy, any sort of toxicities they have, being a little deconditioned from a hospital stay. It can definitely take some time for people to get their activity level, their endurance back. Sometimes people require some physical therapy or occupational therapy, and we can help coordinate that based on their needs. We, we often get asked about travel after CAR-T. Um, this is something that we usually refer to the doc, we defer to the doctors, but it ultimately depends on how a patient is recovering both physically and then how their immune system is recovering. Um, finally, a lot of people want to know when can I return to work after this? And again, it, it really depends on how patients are recovering, um, but I usually recommend patients plan to be out of work about two to three months from the time that they get their CAR T cells, just to give them plenty of time to recover and really get back to, to how they were pre CAR T. And I'll hand things over to Amanda. Thank you. Thank you so much um, to everyone for taking the time to join us today. Thank you to the NCCN, Dr. Armand and Lauren. It's just really an honor to be here with all of you. Um, I am an information specialist with the Leukemia Lymphoma Society's Information Resource Center, and I will be spending my portion speaking about the real-life considerations that patients and caregivers can face, um, also be talking about um, uh, where, where you can get support and how, and then just share some information about our LLS programs and services that may be helpful to you. So a cancer diagnosis isn't just a medical diagnosis, it's a diagnosis to every aspect of life. So the other side of the cancer diagnosis includes the emotional, physical, financial, and practical aspects that a patient and their caregivers must grapple with. There's no question that many of these concerns can overlap, and this list is by no means exhaustive. Um, patient and caregiver needs and concerns are fluid and can change throughout treatment. 
So ongoing communication with your healthcare team is crucial from diagnosis through treatment and beyond. So knowing who on your team can assist you in addressing what your concerns may be and what resources are available to you internally and externally to guide you is important. So this slide contains some areas of focus as we look further into these considerations. So not everyone copes with or views their diagnosis in the same way. And we wanna keep in mind cultural and spiritual beliefs. So some patients live alone and do not ha have caregivers at home, thus highlighting the opportunity for the treatment team to explore what the patient wants and as desired, connect them to their community supports and resources. At the same time, other patients may now be unable to care for their family members that they had been caring for prior to their diagnosis. Roles within the home can also change. Again, this is an opportunity to explore what support and resources you may need that can help you. Patients may also have concerns about how their cancer affects others in their lives. There may be questions like, who do I tell about my cancer? How much do I tell them? When do I tell them? And members of your treatment team can help you navigate through these questions and further explore your needs. You may have financial and employment concerns. So, and these can, these can occur in many scenarios. Perhaps a treatment is not covered by your insurance or you have high out of pocket costs. There are members of your treatment team that can help you explore your insurance options, coverage, and refer you to resources for financial assistance. So LLS has a section on our website that provides financial assistance for patients, including copay programs, travel assistance, urgent need assistance, Assistance. Uh, LLS also has a section of the website titled Other Helpful Organizations, which includes sections for financial and health insurance resources and information. With treatment comes side effects, and it's important to communicate these concerns openly and directly with your doctor and your healthcare team, like we just heard from Lauren, so that they can help guide you towards best side effect management strategies. Some may have a predisposed or diagnosed mental health issue. As part of your treatment, it's important to be referred to appropriate mental health support and resources. Emotional needs may be addressed by getting a referral to a support group, online support programs, peer-to-peer -peer connections, and the opportunity to talk with someone who has the same diagnosis, has gone through a similar experience, and learn how to manage the disease. LLS has these resources that are available to patients as well as caregivers, and there are also other reliable resources that offer similar programs. And at this time, you can also explore self-care. What self-care practices might you have and what positive coping strategies can you adapt? This is very individualized and can come in many forms. Um, you know, ask you, what have you been doing to take care of yourself? Are you meeting your basic needs? Are you sleeping well, eating? Are you able to participate in any activities that you enjoy? Uh, this can be a time to tap into those healthy things that got you going through difficult times in the past or to find new activities that you may want to participate in. Examples can include engaging in a hobby, listening to music, meditation, prayer, watching comedies, talking to friends, journaling, deep breathing, guided imagery, exercise, the list goes on. And caregiver needs are important to be aware of as well. We spoke about cultural and spiritual beliefs of patients and these may or may not be different for the caregivers. Things to consider will be the caregivers' concerns and needs as they balance their caregiver roles, family responsibilities, employment, and all the issues that can arise. These can vary from caregiver to caregiver, depending on the support systems they may have in place, as well as their employment and financial situations. Keep in mind that sometimes situations can be complicated if a patient and caregiver have to travel a distance or stay for extended periods of time at or near the treatment facility, which we heard you know, can often be the case for CAR-T. Uh, this would be part of a discussion with the treatment team who can assist by providing resources that may be helpful, such as financial, lodging, travel assistance. And just as we spoke about patients who have predisposed or diagnosed, diagnosed mental health issues, sometimes caregivers can have these needs as well. Emotional needs of caregivers can be complicated as they're trying to care for themselves, the patient, and others in their life. 
Similarly, it's important that their concerns are being addressed and are encouraged to seek out those same mental health support and resources. LLS has put together wonderful caregiver works book, workbooks. These can, uh, this resource can assist caregivers with ideas and information to help guide them through these topics. There are also support resources designed specifically for caregivers where they can talk to others who are caring, caring for someone with the same diagnosis, has gone through a similar experience and learn how to manage the disease. LLS has these resources that are available to patients and caregivers. There are also additional reliable resources that offer similar programs. Caregivers should also explore self-care practices. Just as with patients, this is very individualized and can come in many form. Again, what has the caregiver been doing to take care of themselves? Caregivers can benefit from discussions around how they're taking time for themselves or recharging their own batteries so they can provide the very best care to their loved ones. Sometimes caregivers feel that self-care is selfish or that they can't take the time to care for themselves. Do you have someone who can assist you for a few hours so you can take some time for yourself? What do your sleeping and eating patterns look like? Are you able to participate in any activities that you enjoyed? So we've talked about so many considerations for patients and caregivers. Now let's take a closer look at the LLS resources available. So the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society offers educational support and financial assistance programs, all free of charge to blood cancer patients, caregivers, and healthcare providers. This includes the Information Resource Center, where you can speak one-on-one -on -one with an information specialist who can assist you through cancer treatment and financial and social challenges and give accurate, up-to-date, treatment and support information. Our information specialists are highly trained oncology social workers and nurses, personalized assistance for managing uh, treatment decision side effects and dealing with financial and psychosocial challenges. Other personalized services at LLS include our clinical trial support center, where nurse navigators are available at no cost to help healthcare professionals and patients find and answer questions about clinical trials. We also offer uh, nutrition consultations through our Pearl Point Nutrition Services to pa patients and caregivers of all types of cancer, free nutrition education, um, and one-on-one -on -one consultations with a registered dietitian. On these next few slides, I've included additional LLS resources. They include peer support, family support groups, weekly online chats on our LLS community, which is an online discussion board. And as you can see here, um, there's more information that can be found on our website about financial resources. These are just some of our financial assistance programs available. Um, funding opens and closes based on availability. Um, I also just wanted to point out, as I mentioned earlier, that we offer an extensive directory of national and international organizations. You can call our Information Resource Center or visit the website for the most up-to-date information. And then finally, um, LLS has a wide range of education programs and resources that are available to patients and families. These include both local and national education programs that provide patients and caregivers with the chance to hear from top experts on the latest updates in blood cancer research and survivorship. Uh, we host these programs throughout the year with a wide range of topics. And in addition to programs, we also have a library of materials available, including on-demand webinars, podcasts, books, webcasts, and a library of booklets and printed materials that are available to download and order free of charge. You may find that your treatment center has a selection of these, um, and you can also request the materials from the website or by speaking with an information specialist. And all of our booklets are available in both English and Spanish, and we are increasing our library of education programs in Spanish as well. And the best way to contact or connect with any of these programs and services is by calling the Information Resource Center. Again, our information specialists are available 
Monday to Friday from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Time. We do have bilingual Spanish speaking information specialists and, and the use of an interpretation service. So thank you all again for your time and we really hope to hear from you soon. We're here for you. Great. Thanks so much, Amanda. And thanks to all of our all of today's presenters. Um, the Q and A session will begin shortly. Uh, please feel free to go ahead and submit your questions to the presenters using the Q and A box, but not the chat box. Here is here is one question: uh, How long does the do the infused CAR T cells last in the body? Since they also attack normal B cells, how long does that effect last? So it, it's variable. Um, you can actually, if you look even at one year later, in many patients, you can still find evidence of CAR T. Uh, but despite that, most patients have recovery of their B cell count within several months of CAR T. So having some persistent CAR T activity doesn't mean that patients won't recover their B cells. But in some patients, the CAR Ts disappear. And yet we think they still can be cured of their lymphoma, even if the CAR Ts disappear from the body. If you have been diagnosed with hypogamma globulinemia, excuse me, would that make CAR T more difficult? No, no, it, it does. Hypogamma globulinemia uh, is one of the complications of CAR T because of the B cell depletion. Uh, and some people re replete um, immunoglobulin, so give IVIG in patients after CAR T who have low antibody levels. So we, we don't do it routinely unless patients get recurrent infections, but it's not a contraindication to CAR T treatment. Let's see, we have one, a question about under what conditions is autologous not feasible? I'm guessing they mean autologous CAR T. It, it's actually, it, it's very rare that it's not feasible. So most patients, there are some patients who just have so few T cells that uh, they can't manufacture CAR T, but that's very rare. Most patients have enough CAR T that uh, they can be successfully manufactured. I don't know if Lauren, you have any other thoughts on that? Uh, no, I think you answered that. Great. Let's see. Um, we have an inquiry about the relationship of skele abnormal skeletal muscle and lactate dehydro dehydrogenase (LDH) um, with normal. Yeah, so it's about a study, I guess, the, about the relationship of and a study found abnormal skeletal muscle um, and a relationship between overall survival after CAR-T. I, I think I know what you're referring to, the, the study of sarcopenia. And that that's what, if, if that's what you mean, sarcopenia refers to low skeletal muscle mass. And I think that's just a general phenomenon. I don't think it's actually specific to CAR-T, but in general, low muscle mass travels with greater illness. So people who are sicker have lower muscle mass. And I think that's why, if it's what I'm thinking about, I think that's why maybe that particular study found the association. There are a lot of associations like that that are not necessarily specific to a treatment, but that just connote greater overall frailty or, or illness. Um, if a patient had previously harvested stem cells, could T cells be collected from these? From a previously collected? I don't, I don't know. Uh, it's, it's not, it's a good question. I don't think there'd be a need to, because you could just collect them fresh, but I don't know if you could go back to a frozen product and use it for CAR T. I, we've yeah. never done it to the best of my knowledge, but good question. Matt. Yeah, I haven't seen that happen either. Okay. Thank you. Uh, because CAR T is relatively new, does LLS have peer support for CAR T specifically, meaning support from people who have gone, those who've gone through CAR-T? That's a great question. So we do. Um, our first connection program, so we have trained peer volunteers um, that we can connect you with for a conversation or two. We certainly do have some CAR-T um, volunteers. So yes, that's an option. We do the best that we can with whom we have in our system um, to try to connect you with um, you know, whomever would be most appropriate for you. And we are always looking for more volunteers. So if, you've, uh, if you'd like to, we can certainly connect you. Um, and we also have our online chats. 
um, and our LLS community as well, which is an online discussion board. And for that, we actually do have a CAR T group. Um, it's not live, it is truly like a discussion board um, and it's pretty active. Great, thank you. Um, here's a question regarding uh, how is the decision made uh, regarding the site of care inpatient versus outpatient? for CAR T infusion? A lot of that is decided during the screening process. Um, we really want to make sure that the patient getting their CAR T outpatient is, is somebody who can safely do so. We wanna make sure that it's not somebody who has a relatively high burden of disease, because in that case, we would expect them to have some more serious toxicities. We also wanna make sure that they have a caregiver who's able to take on that expanded role and be a little bit more involved with during the, doing the assessments, the vital signs. Um, so those things are definitely weighed in. Um, it's, it's definitely more common to be admitting patients and doing their CAR T infusion inpatient, but I think the hope is that we're gonna start doing more and more outpatient with time. Um, we have an inquiry um, about the long-term side effects of CAR T. And just specific, anything? Like what are the long-term side effects? They didn't specify, uh, <laughs> um, I guess so just. It depends what, depends what one means by long-term. Uh, if you there's the long term, which is beyond the immediate treatment period, beyond the first month, let's say, and as we talked about, a lot of that is is referable to infectious toxicities, which comes from B cell depletion, prior chemotherapy, T cell dysfunction, etc. So, most of the toxicity in that in that uh, uh, period is uh, infectious, uh, and also the low blood count issue that that sometimes can go on for for a long time. There's not the, the FDA has mandated these really long term studies of 15 years of, um, from a lot of the clinical trials to, to try to understand if there's additional long term toxicity, like second cancers, et cetera. And, and to the best of my knowledge, no, there's nothing, there's no clear signal yet. Uh, patients who come to CAR T have, they already have cancer, they've had prior chemotherapy, so they're at risk for second cancers, second leukemias, et cetera. But it's not at least CAR T doesn't seem to confer a much higher risk uh, of those um, of those side effects. Can patients with impaired renal function undergo CAR T? Yes, so there's, so there's been a there's been a gradual like a lot of therapy a gradual shift towards using it farther and farther from the initial trial populations, and there's now experience in some places even giving CAR T on patients on dialysis. That's way beyond the pale. But it is doable at least. So, it, it uh, kidney dysfunction creates a lot of other problems and makes makes everything more complicated. But and it's not it's not absolute contraindication. It most most centers like ours have cut off for kidney function, but it it can be done in some cases. So, yeah. Cautious answer. At Dana Farber, we have successfully treated patients on dialysis too several times. Um, it definitely takes a lot of coordination with the renal teams and the dialysis teams, um, but we have uh, a protocol that we follow to kind of alternate the, the chemotherapy with their dialysis schedule so that they're still getting dialyzed um, before and during CAR-T. Is there an association with acquiring autoimmune disease after CAR-T? Not, not that I know of. This was also a concern initially. Uh, including in patients with pre-existing autoimmune disease, they're concerned that we would take their T cells, which are already self-recognizing, and somehow boost them. But it hasn't uh, it hasn't materialized, I think, in any significant signal, at least that uh, that that I'm aware of or have come across. Can you comment on the age or the oldest patients you have treated with CAR T, and is age um, any sort of predictor of response? Lauren, what's the oldest we have? Do you know. Um, I think our cutoff is 86 and I actually had 1 patient who turned 86 on the day that she was discharged and she had a complete remission and is still in remission. Um, so we do have a cutoff, um, but again, it, it definitely varies patient to patient. Some people who are younger don't have as good of a response as those who might be older. It really depends on kind of how they, how they are clinically going into this and then how they respond to the treatment. And, and there's been no, there's been no documentation of what the upper limits should be. 
So as, as, as Laura said, we, we've taken patients in the late 80s. There are some centers I've heard that have taken a 90-year-old to CAR T. Uh, so age by itself, again, like the kidney dysfunction, while a lot of centers have cutoffs, but there's no absolute cutoff. And there is data from the clinical trials uh, that looked at the older population, in quotes, uh, didn't seem to have any impaired outcome in terms of lymphoma control. In fact, if anything, it seemed to be maybe slightly better. So, so age is not age by itself should not be a, a contraindication. During the thirty days being do, of caregiver monitoring, does the caregiver need to be present at all times, or can a patient be left unsupervised for brief periods to run an errand, um, etc.? That's a good question. Um, unfortunately, the patient does require a caregiver around the clock. Um, so many times we have people who have more than one caregiver just so that people can alternate that responsibility and there's no burden on one person. Um, but it, if in the event that somebody did need to, you know, run an errand, go to an appointment of their own, the patient would have to go with them. Um, the patients are, are likely going to be pretty independent, still able to bathe themselves, cook for themselves, take care of themselves, but we wouldn't want them being left alone completely, even for a brief period of time, because if any of these delayed toxicities occur, they might not even realize it and know how to respond to it. For say, if, if a patient develops some late onset confusion, they might not know what's happening and not know how to call us or, you know, appropriately manage what's going on. Let's see. Um, is there any looking towards the future? Is there any uh, research being done on expanding the indication of CAR-T, such as for solid tumors? Yeah, that's the that's a holy grail right now, because it works well in lymphoma, many subsets of lymphoma, although there's some that, that still um, or not where there's no CAR T, like T cell lymphoma, for example, has been more, more challenging for some reason. It works in myeloma. There's been a lot of work in leukemia, acute leukemia, and it's it's approved in B cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Uh, but there are efforts in acute myelogenous leukemia or AML. Uh, but the real the real grail is solid tumor. And there's a lot of research going on, and there's some interesting early findings. So we all hope that it works in solid tumors and that we find ways to deliver it. But it's it's a very it's a very complicated um, it, it's a big challenge. Um, we have, have an inquiry about eligibility for CAR T uh, for those who don't have insurance. Our financial counselors um, can definitely be in contact with the patients who are under or uninsured. Um, the manufacturers of the CAR-T products also have patient assistance programs where they can offer some financial assistance to people who might not have the means to get through this treatment and you know, staying locally and everything that CAR-T uh, requires. Um, but it, it definitely varies center to center and product by product, um, but there are financial assistance avail resources available. I can piggyback on that too, um, that talking to the social worker also at the treatment center as well to see if you qualify for any state insurance programs or through the marketplace as well. Um, and then, you know, as we mentioned, there's limited financial assistance available, um, you know, through many organizations, um, but probably really good to talk to the social worker too to see what your options are. References triple hit, which may be familiar, a term familiar to Dr. Armand, but I'm not sure. Does triple hit affect the likely results of CAR-T treatment? What is the survival rate? So it's a good question. In general, the, the the data seems to be that double hit or triple hit lymphoma are roughly similarly sensitive to CAR T as regular diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So double hit or triple hit refer to these lymphomas that have translocation in genes like MYC in particular, BCL2, BCL6, uh, and they are they're definitely harder to treat with chemotherapy. For CAR T, it may be less important. So, so it still uh, seems to work just as well in that setting. In general, for lymphoma, for aggressive lymphoma, uh, the long-term remission rate is about 40% for patients who get to CAR. Uh, it, it, it might be a little bit lower in, the, um, in some of these more aggressive subhistologies, but it, it's probably still within the ballpark. 
Um, we have time for just a couple more questions. Um, going back to the insurance coverage uh, question, have you run into situations where it is not authorized by insurance? And if so, how, how are those cases managed? In my experience, if we ever get pushback from an insurance about authorizing the treatment, usually we are able to appeal and present more information, clinical information. Sometimes it's a conversation between the doctor and the case manager at the insurance to really advocate for the patient and, and let the insurance know that this is a, a required treatment for them. So in most cases, it's ultimately authorized. Um, if you are in partial remission, are you eligible for a CAR-T? It depends. The, 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 it's hard to answer the question as posed. It depends on the disease, on what the prior lines of therapy were, et cetera. So, hard to answer. Um, there's a question about the, uh, the insurance coverage of Anakinra. Anakinra? Um, and um, insurance providers seem slow to recognize and cover this. Do you have any thoughts on this issue? I, I, I don't. We, we have been able to use it here. Obviously, it, it's not commonly used. It's in pretty, it's in cases where the toxicity is pretty advanced and not responding to standard treatment. Anakin is not FDA approved in this setting, but we've been able to use it. Um, but it, it, that's not a, it's not a general comment about, about its ability to be used elsewhere. It's definitely not. It's not, it's not approved, so it's off label use. Thank you. Oh, we have one that just came in. If you had Bexar, do you, are you familiar? Bexar, B E X X A R, can you have CAR T? Yeah, it's fine. There's no, there's no treatment, there's no prior treatment that's a contraindication to CAR T. So, well, great. It looks like uh, we have um, answered all of the questions that have come in. Um, so it looks like we are just about out at time. Um, thank you again to all of the presenters. And we would also like to thank the NCCN Foundation. We'd also like to thank um, the corporate supporter of this webinar, Kite Pharmaceuticals. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.